Once again, it seems that India's top diplomat has delivered another knockout punch, and this time it is directed toward the Western media. So the question is, are many Western journalists too afraid to use the term Christian nationalist for their own government just the way they use the term Hindu nationalist for the Indian government? Many in India feel that Christian oppressors or pro-Christian governments from Europe have humiliated, terrorized, looted or subjugated other countries and have even genocided various cultures. But despite that, there are not many journalists in the West who have the guts or the intention to speak the truth. And India's Minister of External Affairs, Subramaniam Jashankar, is not too happy about that. So, Mr. Jashankar, my name is Karolina, and as a citizen of the European Union, I can tell you that if there was an Olympic event for hypocrisy and deceit, Western journalists would win all the gold medals. <laughs> to start with, the term Christian nationalist is perhaps too weak to fully describe the xenophobic, racist, and genocidal character that has often been observed in our Western societies or our governments. And second, in many Western countries, Christian nationalism is just the way of life, no matter which political party comes to power. And yes, quite often, this Christian nationalism is even supported by the Constitution. And third, as a citizen of the European Union, I am not afraid to use the term Christian nationalist for some of the most atrocious governments which rule or have ruled various countries in the Western world. Yes, Mr. Jashankar, you have a valid point. You really do. For example, let's take the former Prime Ministers of the UK into consideration. Liz Truss and Boris Johnson. Both from the Conservative Party, right? Now, please, pay attention. It is the same Conservative Party whose leaders have participated in a European alliance collaborating with neo-Nazis or those who sympathize with them. Yes, this also included Christian British MPs who openly joined hands with the Christian fundamentalists and others who support xenophobia across Europe. But then, why were they not labelled as Christian nationalists on a global scale? Now, let's focus on her. She is not an ordinary woman. Her name is Roberta Mazzola and she is the President of the European Parliament representing or preaching the so-called European values to the world. She hails from Malta, a country that is a part of the European Union. But mind you, our European Parliament's president's own country formally protects and favors a particular church, the Roman Catholic. Now, let's quickly go through Malta's constitution. Chapter 1, Article 2. Official religion. Of course, it is all about Christianity. But read this over here. In Malta, the authorities of the Roman Catholic Apostolic Church have the duty and the right to teach which principles are right and which are wrong. Wow, so are these the European values that she brags about? In her own country, the Church has the right to teach the citizens what is right and what is wrong as described in their constitution. Not only that, read this over here. Religious teaching of the Roman Catholic Apostolic Faith shall be provided in all state schools as part of compulsory education. Mr. Jashankar, what can I say here? Forget the political parties and their ideologies, here our European Parliament's president's own country's constitution is filled with Christian nationalism. Anyway, since we are here, let us quickly examine the political ideology she has been associated with. In Malta, the Nationalist Party. And over here, Group of the European People's Party. Please pay attention to this over here. Christian Democrats. So what political ideology does this involve? The answer is Christian democracy. Remember, it is not secular democracy. It is Christian democracy. Well, here all I can say is that if something like Hindu democracy ever becomes a globally well-accepted political ideology, probably the journalists from the BBC and CNN would beat their chest day and night, shouting from the rooftops and releasing non-stop venom against India and Hindus. Anyway, back in the USA, whether the president is a Democrat or a Republican, the flavor of Christian nationalism never seems to die. So this is George W. Bush. This is Bill Clinton. This is Ronald Reagan, and this is Donald Trump. All are joining hands or celebrating their personal relationship with this man, Billy Graham, an American evangelical Christian figure who dedicated his life to the radical task of the total evangelization of the world. And see this man here. That's his son, Franklin Graham, another radical or controversial Christian figure who has been working tirelessly to Christianize India. 
In India, this man, Franklin Graham, wrote of hundreds of millions of people locked in the darkness of Hinduism, bound by Satan's power. Despite this, the organization of this man, who is a right-wing fundamentalist, has openly received support from both Republican and Democratic presidents. But then, why did the Western journalists not label those American presidents as Christian nationalists? And guess what? See this picture. Here, President Reagan is presenting Billy Graham with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Yes, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the USA's highest civilian honor, was presented to a man who worked for the total evangelization of the world. But how many Western journalists use the term Christian nationalist to describe this American president or his government? As I mentioned earlier, the harsh truth is that Christian nationalism has been the way of life in the Western world. In the UK Parliament, there are compulsory Christian prayers, special Christian prayer breakfast and Bible study, regardless of the political party that is ruling the country. The United Kingdom's official religion is Christianity. And yes, David Cameron, the former Prime Minister, openly stated that the UK is a Christian country and we should not be afraid to say so. And no, in many Western countries, there are no national public holidays for the festivals of the indigenous communities. There are no national public holidays for Muslim festivals, Hindu festivals and Buddhist festivals, regardless of how big these religious minorities are in number or proportion. Not only that, in the UK, the church even has an automatic right to appoint 26 bishops to the upper house of their parliament. Isn't this Christian nationalism, which is legitimatized, institutionalized and a part of the national policy in action and in practice? Of course, in reality, these Western nations are definitely not the champions of liberalism, inclusivity or multiculturalism. They seem to be the champions of the seat. The US government even funded the evangelical organizations which work abroad to convert non-Christians to Christianity, but how many Western journalists branded the US government as Christian nationalist? Besides that, the ordinary Christians in the West regularly donate in churches for Christian missionary work and even school kids in the West pack gifts in Christmas boxes which are used for fraudulent religious conversions of innocent children in India and elsewhere. This way, almost all sections of Western societies, directly or indirectly, participate in the global Christian mission of the total evangelization of the world. And yet, these governments and countries have the audacity to tell us that they believe in pluralism and inclusivity while killing the global diversity and shamelessly participating in the global cultural genocide. Of course, what I'm telling you in this episode is just the tip of the iceberg. If you want to broaden your understanding regarding Christian nationalism in the West, please watch these three episodes. And yes, before I sign off, there is something I would like to remind you of. Christians, including Christian soldiers, Christian pirates, Christian invaders and Christian terrorists came to India and to other parts of the world to terrorize, loot, colonize and subjugate. Blessed by the church and with the motivation to Christianize. That was one of the worst effects of Europeans Christian nationalism that the world ever saw. On the other hand, Hindu soldiers and others from India went to Europe during the World War and saved Europeans from their own Nazism or Fascism. Western journalists should educate themselves. You know I'm telling the truth that you are afraid of speaking. Yes, violence from Hindus should be critically examined. But do they really expect Hindus to surrender to those who have taken a pledge to Christianize India or to replace the Hindu culture with theirs? Do they really expect no Hindu resistance against the Christian nationalists in the West who are working on the task of the total evangelization of the world? Yes, for obvious reasons, many journalists in the West may never use the term Christian nationalism to describe their leaders or governments, but as a citizen of the European Union, I did many months ago in this episode. And please, listen to me before they try to silence my voice. See you again.